Hello, good morning. Uh, really happy to have you here. Um, kind of sad uh, that this is now our second to, uh, to last salon. Um, yeah, it feels really hard to stop. I think, you know, after having seen you, all of you now for like uh, 10 weeks, you know, almost on a daily basis. Uh, but, you know, uh, Lou and I are already cooking up the new, uh, the, the next online gathering. So uh, we don't have to wait for too long, but maybe we can, after the salon, do a little sharing on, uh, you know, what, uh, which of the, which were your favorite salons in the past 10 weeks? And uh, what did you really like? What didn't you like? That's what we initially wanted to do last yesterday, but then <laughs> we just spiraled out of control. Uh, okay, so let's see where we're going to end up after today's salon. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't think Queer needs an introduction. I think Queer has been one of the folks that has been on here now for almost every day, uh, really in the last 10 weeks. And uh, he's not only like, you know, really just like, a fantastic intellectual light, a very, very, very dear friend, um, you know, really dear member of our family. <laughs> um, and, um, and yeah, I have tremendously enjoyed kind of like uh, really, you know, quite daily like check-ins with him uh, in the evenings where we usually like hack on a little, a little bit about what happened in the salons and, you know, like uh, kind of like what's going on in our lives. And, and, and he shared with me like just, I think, very, uh, uh, like very... Um, very special information where afterwards I always uh, I always would like to channel you in, uh, in new conversations that I go into. So thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I think, uh, you know, you've, uh, if there's one thing that you're, you're known for in the FOSA community is that you always kind of like a pit bull, kind of like entangle yourself on a topic, learn everything there possibly is to know about it. And then you make those insane Google drives and docs to share with everyone. Uh, so it's oh, really thanks. cool uh, that you currently have uh, put your, uh, um, put your focus on immunology. Uh, meanwhile, if you can uh, uh, ask him also for his various write-ups on anything from a ketogenic diet to research on regenerative agriculture to a host of different things. He actually gave a vision weekend talk at our annual member gathering in person last year on learning to learn. So on his kind of like approach to how to learn as much as possible in as little time as possible. And I'm going to share a link to that talk in here because it's more like a meta approach to uh, how people can learn well. Um, and, you know, you can, uh, you can now put some meat to the bones and then actually tell you about what you learned on uh, the topic of immunology. So this would be a primer, mostly Kieran talking. Uh, we'll be collecting uh, questions on the chat and Kieran, maybe you can screen them, but, you know, maybe we can, because they, they'll probably be quite topic specific, we can probably have a, a pretty good um, back and forth, hopefully between participants and you. And I'll try to moderate it a little bit so that you don't have to monitor the chat. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, um, thanks, great. sounds great. Uh, okay, without further ado, we and take it away on immunology and I'll share a few links on like previous foresight salons that you've done. Great, thanks, Alison. Uh, so yeah, I used to be involved somewhat in the immunology field. Uh, maybe 15 plus years ago and i decided uh, and it was fascinating and i loved doing the work and so i, I um uh, it kind of also got me into life extension and regeneration and all this kind of stuff and then most recently with the uh, covid situation i decided to go back and try and sort of catch up and see what had happened in the intervening time since i hadn't really been paying that much attention to the field and then because i you know, I don't like to just do this all for myself. I really enjoy trying to condense years or weeks worth of information into a presentation for my smart friends to try and, you know, bring them uh, along as best I can uh, in an efficient manner, so save them the trouble of having to do a lot of study or at least get them enthusiastic and and uh, enthralled with the same kinds of stuff that I am. So this is going to be a kind of Forgive me if you've already like gone to school in biology. In that case, you may not learn that much from this. This is going to be molecular biology through the lens of immunology, through the lens of the T cell receptor. And we're going to try to get as quickly as we can to the T cell receptor, which is the sort of real nugget of beauty inside just a vast universe of beauty, which is molecular biology. And But the T-cell receptor is the thing that a lot of people don't know about, even a lot of biologists, even a lot of people working in vaccines and stuff like that in, in COVID. This is a thing that I feel um, really, it helps to understand no matter where you are, it'll help you understand the absolute astonishing beauty and miraculousness of life if you're sort of a just smart person and if you're particularly a biologist or a person working 
uh, in antivirals, then you may know a lot of this stuff, but perhaps at least I will be able to provide some beauty uh, and some really gorgeous visualizations along the way. This is going to be a very visual talk. I'm going to show like 100 slides. So let's get started. So first, I'm going to discuss my sources of information. Um, by the way, we're going to be talking about the, the mammalian adaptive immune system largely. Other th immune systems exist in nature, and mammals have more than the adaptive immune system. But when people keep talking about, like, do, does exposure to the virus confer immunity, they're talking about adaptive or acquired immunity. Uh, and there's a lot more to immunity, which we'll talk some about, but we're going to focus on an adaptive acquired immunity, and that's centered around T cells. No matter what anybody says about antibodies, blah, 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 it's really the T cell is, is running the show. So we're going to have to uh, gonna talk about my sources of information quickly because I want to share them with you because they're so great, I think. We're going to have to go through basic molecular biology. What do cells do? Because to understand immunity, we kind of have to understand viruses, and to understand viruses, we have to understand what cells do. So then we'll move on to what viruses do. And then once we've got all that preliminaries, we'll get into the meat of it, which was how does the mammalian system collaborate? It's a multi-cell collaborative distributed process with specialized cells. How does it collaborate when the, when the system gets infected, particularly by viruses? Okay. So I'm going to go through a little bit of sub detail on each of these slides in the text form, and then it's all going to be visuals from then on, just so you don't think I'm doing too much basic biology 101. We're going to, the sources of information can, and concern the experimental techniques, electron microscopy and sequencing and PCR and all these things on the first bullet. Nobel prizes are for every one of these things. In fact, in general, for every slide I show, you can bet that there was a Nobel prize awarded for the work that is, uh, is, described in that slide. And in general, this talk here is like tens of thousands of peoples of careers have bit gone into creating the knowledge that I'm trying to distill. And every slide would involve hundreds of careers and many, many, many publications and laboratories and everything. Then we're going to go into my sources that I used for visualizing uh, biology at the molecular and macromolecular scale. Some really beautiful stuff going to talk briefly about some of my recommended books on biology, my recommended books on virology and immunology, and my recommended books on protein structure and function. Books. Books are the way to go. Scientific papers are great to get started, but when you need the background material, you need to read books. Wikipedia doesn't cut it, okay? Wikipedia is great for if you want to just spend, you know, five minutes studying something, but if you really want to learn something, uh, Wikipedia Try to go deeper. It's too shallow, and it's and it's not of uniformly high quality. Whereas books tend to be very high quality. Okay, and for the what do cells do normally? We're going to talk about cell types. We're going to talk about the central dogma of molecular biology. We're going to talk about the genetic code and the basics of transcription, translation, amino acids, and peptides. We're going to talk a lot about protein structure because that's critical to understanding immunology and the diversity of protein structure. And we're going to talk briefly about other ma macromolecules like lipid membranes and then transmembrane proteins, which are kind of a combination of lipid membranes and proteins. We're going to talk about sugars and protein glycosylation, and then we will kind of have covered all the basic macromolecules of life. And then we're going to really get into the meat of the thing when we talk about antigen presentation and the major histocompatibility complex. That's where we're getting into stuff that maybe people really don't know unless they're immunologists or virologists. Then we're going to back off and look at viruses, the diversity of viruses in nature, compare the structures of a bunch of different viruses, and look at the virus life cycle, which involves infection, because that's how viruses, if they can be said to be alive, they're only are arguably alive when they've infected a host. And then lastly, we're going to talk about tying it all together. Once we've understood what cells do and what viruses do, we're going to talk about what cells do when they get infected by viruses. So we're going to tie together the central dogma, the virus life cycle, the major histocompatibility complex and antigen presentation. Then we're going to introduce the T cell receptor, how it relates to the MHC antigen complex. Um, we're going to talk about molecular recognition and self versus non-self. A relatively new thing called the immunological synapse and a little bit about T-cell signaling, the cascade and the regulation of the T-cell response, what happens to T-cells once they get um, uh, put into action. And then we're going to go finally back and compare all this acquired immunity we've been studying to the innate immune system, which is also always in action inside of mammals and other animals. And we're going to summarize the magic of T-cells and why they need to be 
foremost in your thinking when you think about immunity. And then lastly, we're going to talk about COVID and the common cold and how they relate, kind of to bring it home. So the first thing to do is sources of information. The main source of information that generated all this stuff was the invention of the electron microscope. Nobel Prize was awarded for that, of course. It happened almost 85 years ago, and it allowed us to see things much smaller than the wavelength of light. This is, well, this is a dividing bacterium, but it's a single bacterium. Um, it is uh, only about a thousandth of a millimeter across and a few thousandths of a millimeter long, but it is a full on organism. Okay. Uh, here is a full on dividing bacterium. I mean, it does everything. It doesn't have a nucleus, but it's got DNA, it's got RNA, it's got proteins. It manufactures tens of thousands of different proteins and other molecules that it needs to live. It, 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 metabolizes, it seeks out food, it flees from hostile environments, it evolves, it self-repairs, it self-replicates. And by the way, it's subject to infection by viruses. Uh, even though it's a single prokaryotic primitive cell and it has its own immune system that was recently discovered, which is called CRISPR. Okay. And so uh, we're not going to talk about CRISPR and the bacterial immune system, but I just want to say this is like your prototypical uh, organism and this, the details of the organism, which you can see inside here and the little uh, uh, things sticking off the membrane and the, the structure inside, that was only available when the, when the uh, electron microscope got in, uh, invented. And there's been several different kinds of electron microscopes invented over the course of many years. And most of them have obtained Nobel Prizes, the people who invented them. So, but we're not going to use so much electron micrographs as we're going to use people who've studied electron micrographs and molecular biology. We're going to be drawing from this book by David Goodsell. This is probably the one biology book I'd say everyone should buy, which is called The Machinery of Life. And what it is, is it is descriptions of the molecular and macromolecular nature of life done by David Goodsell. David Goodsell is a painter and a biologist, and he paints paintings of biological systems based on um, protein structure predictions and X-ray crystallography and electron microscopy. And on the left is his classic cover shot painting that he made of an E. coli bacterium. And on the right is a recent painting he just completed of um, uh, coronavirus, uh, actually, in its uh, life cycle. So let's look at David Goodsell's uh, picture of this bacterium to get a understanding of the molecular and macromolecular nature of life. As I said, this is about a thousandth of a millimeter across. The yellow stuff is DNA, uh, the strands. Bacteria do not have nuclei. Their DNA is kind of free floating. All the purple and blue stuff surrounding the DNA is cellular proteins and ribosomes that basically do the job of turning the DNA into proteins and then run all the millions of different uh, me mechanical operations that are required for the maintenance and operation division of the bacterium. And then around the edge of the bacterium is this green lipid membrane with little um, polysaccharides, i.e. sugars poking out like fuzz. And then there are these, for this kind of bacterium, E. coli, there's these um, cilia, or these flagella, these long whips that it can use to get around. So now we're gonna zoom in on this part of the bacterium, zooming in farther, here's the flagellum, here's the flagellar motor, here in yellow, in yellow is the DNA being turned into RNA, which is this pink stuff, which carries information. Then these purple ribosomes turn that into proteins, like a computer operated factory. The proteins are very many different kinds. They are in blue and in green. And the whole thing is just this amazing um, uh, piece. It's the only piece of working molecular nanotechnology that we know about. And unfortunately we didn't build it. It was built by nature. It is a total miracle. And this is just a bacterium. If we zoom in now on like one of these proteins and a piece of RNA, now we can start to see the molecular scale. Again, Goodsell's paintings. This is a protein. This is a piece of RNA holding instructions for how to build proteins. And then this is the only time we'll see this. These little light blue guys are water molecules. These are ions, the red ones, where the water molecules kind of cluster around them. And these pink things are small molecules like sugars and, and amino acids and stuff. This is the only time we'll see the waters. You have, to imp you have to assume when you see something like this that it's just filled with water, like, like here, water. Okay, so here's a good cell picture of another kind of bacterium. Again, we see DNA, ribosomes, proteins in blue, lipid membrane, and polysaccharides in green. 
Here's a nerve cell, good cell painting. This is a cell from a human. The nerve axon is perpendicular to the screen here. This blue part in the bottom right, electrical impulses travel along the nerve. These green lipid membranes are the myelin sheath that essentially act as electrical insulation around the nerve. And then this orange stuff is the extracellular matrix that we're not gonna talk a lot about, but that's not part of the cell, but it's made by cells and it's outside the cells. Uh, here's an, an, a synapse, a drawing by good cell. Uh, these, uh, this is an electrical impulse transiting across the synapse, electrochemical impulse. What that means is vesicles of neurotransmitters shown in yellow, these little lipid vesicles inside the output neuron or the axon at the upper half of the page is dumping neurotransmitters into the synaptic cleft. The neurotransmitters are being absorbed by receptors on the receiving neuron. Here's the extracellular matrix that is between them. And the point is, me even speaking to you and you watching this and you seeing this and you perceiving this and you thinking about this or whatever the hell you are thinking about is because hundreds of trillions of these things are happening every second in your brain in your hundreds of billions of neurons and making you and every organism with a nervous system do whatever it does with its brain and so this is all that's happening in some sense neurotransmitters being released by cells just at such a high speed, you can't imagine it. Here, then we're gonna look at, into viruses. Here is um, a really good recent technical book on viruses and immunology, which happens to feature on its cover on the left here, a drawing of an Ebola virus by David Goodsell. Uh, and then here on the right is another virology book that's pretty interesting. It's more like a survey of, it's a sort of, it's sort of like a catalog of viruses that has two pages on each virus and what they look like and how they operate. And you can see just the incredible diversity of viral forms because it is incredible. Uh, and this also happens to be, this is an electron micrograph that's false colored. The, there's like a, some human cell or monkey cell in yellow, colored yellow, and then blue is again, Ebola virus attacking the cell. So there you can sort of see left to right molecular scale versus sort of histological scale what's going on. Then here are my sources on protein structure. Protein structure is important to understand and we'll go through some of it to understand immunology. This is an old book, like 15 years old that I studied protein structure from. It's still a really, really good book and a good introduction. On the right is a more complete, more modern book. You can see the, rendish, the renderings of the protein structures are a little more sophisticated and more has been learned. And then lastly, here's the book that started me on my quest this was like a book that i just went into the library and kind of used the spirit guides to guide me to a book on the shelf and i pulled it off um it was a biology book by a guy named renato dalbecco who won the nobel prize he was a virologist he won the nobel prize for discovering that certain viruses cause cancer that at least or some kinds of cancer are directly caused by some kinds of viruses um, and so then he eventually wrote this beautiful book the Design of Life, which is a survey of all of modern biology, at least up to the mid 90s, um, from the lens of viruses. So that's kind of how I'm going, I'm inspired by him to give a survey of immunology through the lens of viruses. So now let's, that's sources of information, let's go to what cells do normally when they're not infected. Cells, here's a liver cell, electron micrograph, nucleus with all the DNA, all liver cells are like chemical factories. They make all thousands, thousands of different chemicals for your body and they degrade thousands of other toxic chemicals for your body. So all these little circular vesicles are individual little chemical factories that are doing one or two things to either create chemicals or destroy chemicals that your body needs or doesn't need. Your liver is the most sophisticated chemical uh, nano, nano, facil nano production facility that exists that we know about. And um, you know all these other structures that you learned about in biology, like endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi are visible here through the miracle of electron microscopy. Um, these little guys, this is a muscle cell. These are mitochondria. As you may know, these are believed to have been bacteria that somehow invaded some primitive cell billions of years ago and established a symbiosis. And they have an energy production cycle that's much more uh, efficient than the one that existed in the cells previously to their symbiosis with mitochondria and mitochondria produce energy. And since this is a muscle cell, it requires a lot of mitochondria, these kind of crinkly guys packed up against these muscle fibers. So the mitochondria make the energy and then the muscle fibers use the energy to contract. And um, I mean, all your cells pretty much have mitochondria. Um, and that's what makes, you know, oxygen metabolizing life, uh, feasible, but uh, 
is just to show a little bit of the variety of cell types. I mean, obviously there's tens of thousands or more of different cell types in the human body, but I just wanted to point out some of the pictures that I thought were pretty. So now we're gonna talk about the central dogma of molecular biology. Now the central dogma of molecular biology says that DNA stores the information. It stores all the code for how to build everything in every cell in your body. And every one of your cell has, every one of the cells in your body has your, the same DNA in it, your genome, which is slightly different from mine, but my cells all have the same one and yours all have your same one unless, unless they've gotten mutated or, or certain other special circumstances. And the DNA stays inside the nucleus and is protected with error correcting codes and special high uh, stability storage mechanisms like the double helix, which is very stable. And the idea is that it's kind of like a tape drive vault in a computer system where the information is, is kept. And then when the information, some information is needed, it is, it is read, read out of the RNA, which is more like the RAM memory. It's like the code that the, that the organism needs at that place and time. So the RNA transcribes the information from the DNA. It's a one-to-one -one transcription. And then the RNA is exported outside of the nucleus uh, into the cytoplasm where it gets turned into proteins. The instructions on the RNA by a many-to-one mapping the sequence of letters on the RNA gets turned to a sequence of amino acids that make a protein. And this is the central dogma. DNA stays in the nucleus, pieces of the DNA that are needed by the cell at its particular life cycle and its particular uh, job get transcribed that information into linear strands of RNA. RNA gets exported and tra translated into linear chains of amino acids, which are proteins. Now that's the central dogma. Of course, when the cell replicates, the DNA has to kind of transcribe, transcribe itself and make a copy, but that we won't talk about replication. Actually, the central dogma has turned out to be much more complicated. It turns out proteins can act backwards on DNA and RNA can act backwards on DNA and RNA can interact with proteins and everything's connected to everything. But anyway, uh, the central dogma is what you have to remember. DNA holds the information, RNA holds and exports the information that is needed by the cell at a particular time to be turned into proteins, and it is proteins do all the jobs in the cell. They're the machines, they're the structure, they're the, the information manipulators, and um, uh, they're the nanomachines. Okay, uh, the genetic code just tells us how three letters, as you know, like let's say A, A, G, G, three letters of the Nucleic acids code for arginine, one of the 20 amino acids which are drawn around the outside of the circle. And let's say, you know, CGT, or let's say CTT codes for leucine, okay? And then let's say uh, TGA codes for stop. That means we've reached the end of an instruction sequence. It's just like a little Turing machine, and that's the end of the gene. And that means it's time to just start, get, stop using those instructions and start on the next instructions. So this, we have this process where DNA gets transcribed to RNA. It's a one-to-one -one mapping. That's done. Here's DNA coming in, being read by this little blue nano machine. And then it, that's the only time the DNA gets unwound out of its double-stranded form where it's only slight. And then that's to make RNA, which is a information copy that's going to get exported outside the nucleus. And then the DNA gets wound up back together so that it stays stable and doesn't get damaged. So RNA polymerase is going to be very important when we get to viruses. Um, the RNA that gets, the DNA here is in orange, is in yellow. The RNA here is in purple. The RNA transcriptase is in dark the RNA is in pink, the RNA transcriptase is purple, the RNA gets exported outside of the nucleus. The nucleus is this blue membrane binding the nucleus, on, uh, holding the nucleus on the left. It gets exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. When it gets into the cytoplasm, the instructions on the RNA will be turned into the particular proteins that the cell needs. That process is called translation, turning RNA into proteins. And here you see the genetic code again, and here you see how each genetic letter codes for an amino acid and each amino acid shown around the periphery here has a different structure. So proteins are just strings of amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids. Each amino acid has a slightly different structure. So you have this 20 letter alphabet that you make 100,000 and 10,000 letter long uh, words made of where the letters are the amino acids. And these are your proteins. Here's the machine that does that. The RNA comes in, 
and this is an inset and the little machine is reading the RNA and then these little arms right here are grabbing the right amino acids and putting them together into this green chain under the instructions of the RNA and then the RNA exits. And uh, this is, uh, so again, it's kind of like a Turing machine. A tape comes in and actions get taken and then this protein comes out using this genetic code where the RNA letters code for the amino acids. Now, here it is in an electron micrograph. Like here it is actually happening. Okay, here's an uh, RNA strand stretching uh, from left to right. My cursor shows you, and here's a whole bunch of these ribosomes riding along this RNA strand, building the, the protein. They're all building the same protein. They're kind of one after the other following the instructions. And here's the protein coming out and folding up into its 3D structure. Uh, and you can see the one RNA strand can direct the synthesis of many, many copies of the same protein. So there's this amplification that goes on. So the basic picture is the DNA holds these letter codes that get translated, that tra transcribed into RNA that eventually get turned into proteins and proteins have this 3D structure. So this is insulin, a very simple protein at the bottom right here. Here's the genetic code for the insulin protein. And then there's these things that get edited out that aren't used. That's a whole nother topic introns okay protein structure how do proteins like what's why am i telling you all this because protein structure is really important and we're going to get to it proteins are made of amino acids as i said here's a schematic of an amino acid these are its atoms all amino acids have the exact same sequence of atoms in their hydrogen oxygen carbon carbon nitrogen and then hydrogens the only thing that differs from one amino acid to the other in the 20 possible uh, essential amino, uh, important amino acids is this group called R. R is a, is a group that differs from one amino acid to the other, but everything else other than the green R is the same for every amino acid. Here you can see this amino group and this carboxy group are the same. Amino carboxy, amino carboxy, amino carboxy, right? All this different are these side chains here in green for these aminos, the side chains in yellow for these aminos, and et cetera, and different colors for these aminos on the right. The, but the amino backbone chain is always the same for every amino. And so what happens is two of these aminos will get joined together. This H2O will get stripped off and become water. And now you've got two amino acids grouped into a, I guess it's called a, uh, a dimer. And then you, the, under the instructions, the um, ribosome keeps putting these amino acids together, the exact ones under the control of the genome. So here we see the set of amino acids that the ribosome strings together. There's 20 different possibilities. That's called the primary structure. What is the sequence of letters? That's the primary structure. Based on the sequence of letters, different things can happen. The protein folds up. Sometimes if the sequence of letters is such that the positively and negatively charged regions line up just right, the linear sequence of beads of amino acids will, focus, will fold up into a helix. Sometimes if the sequences are different, it'll fold up into a sheet. And then the helices and sheets will, okay, the helix and sheet motifs are called the secondary structure. And then the helixes and sheets will fold up in a causal way, always the same, unless you're sick, into a three-dimensional structure of the entire protein, which is called the tertiary structure. Here's the same cartoon done by a different person. Here's this linear sequence of amino acids, the primary structure. It folds up into helices or sheets connected by what are called turns. Turns are very important those secondary elements fold up into the tertiary structure. And then sometimes multi-proteins come together into a quaternary structure. But we're gonna be mostly concerned with the tertiary structure, helices, sheets, and turns. Turns are actually kind of where the action is. The helices and sheets are mostly like the scaffolding and the turns, which you have to remember, have all kinds of atoms sticking out of them, are the, are the actuators of these nanomachines. Uh, here's a close up, you know, different amino acids with their, with their side chains, helix sheet. So here you see ball and stick model, and here you see in blue, the kind of um, uh, ribbon model. Here again, you see kind of a ball and stick model, which is the covalent bonds with some electron density contours shown in gray. So the covalent bonds, the strong bonds of the amino acid just form a backbone chain that's linear. And then this electrostatic and hydrogen bonds, these secondary bonds shown with green dotted lines, they are attraction and repulsion that cause it to fold up, in this case, into a helix shape. In this case, you have to imagine a continuous chain that's serpentining up and down the screen, 
covalently bonded with the black bonds and then the, the blue purple dotted lines are the hydrogen bonds that bring it together into its sheet structure in this case. Now we're going to have to know how to read these molecular pictures and biologists use a whole different library of different ways of representing the same molecule. Here's the ball and stick drawing of a protein, ignore the colors for the moment. Ball and stick drawing, which shows individual atoms as, as balls and bond, covalent bonds as sticks. Here's a space filling representation of the same protein. Here's what's called a um, backbone representation of the same protein. Most of the atoms are missing here. You're just seeing the sequence of basic amino acids strung together without any of their detail. And then on the far right, you see the ribbon diagram with the helixes the sheets and the turns, the little gray parts, and they are, um, these, di these sort of ribbon diagrams are used quite, quite often. But you have to remember that the ribbons omit all this detail of which particular amino acids there, there are with their electronic side chain sticking out, doing the real business. Now these proteins can get quite complicated. Here's a picture of a fairly large, oops, you have a fairly large protein, a transmembrane protein, um, and, it, it transmembrane, it's not shown here, but here in gray at the bottom is a lipid membrane. That's not a protein, that's basically fat. And it, um, it, um, uh, uh, the, the protein goes into the lipid membrane and, and it's part way through it, part of it inside the cell, let's say on the, uh, on the bottom and part of it outside the cell on the top. Uh, here's a close-up of the lipid membrane, not a protein. We won't talk that much about lipid membranes, but they're, like if it wasn't for lipid membranes, there would also be no life. That's what kind of separates every cell inside versus outside. That's what separates every organelle inside versus outside. That's what separates every virus inside versus outside is a lipid membrane. So between lipid membranes, proteins, and small molecules, we've almost got the whole complement of biomolecules. Here's a Here's a transmembrane protein. Here in gray is the lipid membrane. Here is in a ribbon diagram is the transmembrane protein. You can see all these sheet structures into barrels. You can see all these turns on the top, these uh, turns or loops. They are kind of doing the action. This might be a receptor specially coded to look for certain molecules, which then maybe it will let through the pore and other molecules it will not. Just an example of a large protein, a transmembrane protein, another large transmembrane protein. You can see, remember, these are thousands of amino acids denoted here. It's just, it's a miracle. I mean, every one of your cell has tens of thousands of different ones of these things decorating its surface. Here's the David Goodsell picture of the diversity of protein structure, just a sampling. Here's the lipid membrane running top to bottom in yellow and various different examples of transmembrane proteins. Uh, from various organisms kind of just stuck in there. You see we've got tiny little proteins like insulin and glucagon that aren't very symmetrical and digestive proteins like pepsin. We've got antibody proteins. They kind of look like Ys. We've got, uh, we've got bilaterally symmetric proteins and hexagonally symmetric proteins and square symmetric proteins and triangular symmetric proteins. And even the viruses are icosahedrally symmetric protein complexes. And so every possible shape you could imagine and every possible electronic structure you could imagine, I mean, it's just the diversity of protein structure is truly still unknown in a way. And um, that's what makes the diversity of life possible in many ways. Some close-ups of some proteins. Here we have a DNA binding protein. There's many of those. Here we have an antibody. Again, this is David Goodsell's drawings, of course, but just to show you the diversity. And this is just the diversity of shapes, not the diversity of mechanisms and functions. Uh, the last molecule class we're going to talk about is sugars. Sugars can be linear or polysaccharides. One sugar molecule can be linked with others into a polysaccharide. Polysaccharides can also be branched. So here in green at the bottom is a protein, and here at the top in pink and gray is a branched polysaccharide. And I just want to say this is very important because most proteins in biology get decorated with branched polysaccharides, and that is just only starting to be figured out. Uh, uh, the so-called glycome, and it makes things even more complicated than we thought. You know, we thought, oh, once we had the genetic code, then all we need to do is solve protein structure, and once we solve protein structure, we've got it. But no, it turns out everything gets decorated with these branched um, polysaccharides, and so we have to understand that. Like basic vanilla boring proteins get all this stuff put onto them that makes them way more complicated, and this complicates immunology and vaccine design and all this stuff, these sugars. Okay, here's another cartoon. Here's a, here's a membrane. Here in, in dark blue is sort of a cartoon of the transmembrane protein. And it gets decorated with these branched sugars, glycosylated.
Here again, transmembrane protein, and then glycosylation. We're just starting to work out the patterns of glyco glycosylation. Here's the famous um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 spike protein that's shown in the uh, uh, backbone representation. You can see helices and stuff like that. The backbone is shown in, in every color but dark blue. Dark blue is the sugars that decorate it. So you can't just use the genetic code and think you understand the 3D structure of the molecule because after the protein is made from the genetics, it gets glycosylated. Here again is the SARS spike protein in gray, uh, SARS, uh, the COVID spike protein in gray with the sugars that decorate it in different colors. Protein databases now have to incorporate all these, these polysaccharide uh, trees that decorate the proteins. Here's an example of a protein in the database with the polysaccharide tree. Here's the SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike protein bound to the ACE2 receptor. The protein is shown with the ribbon diagrams. The ACE2 receptor protein is shown with the ribbon diagrams. And in magenta are all the sugars that decorate it. And you can see that it's even the sugar-sugar interactions rather than the protein-protein interactions that in some places at least dominate the interaction. So, you know, everybody who just thinks they're going to use bioinformatics to figure this stuff out, I doubt it because of this glycosylation problem. So now let's zoom out and say, what is going on? What's going on? Here's the surface of a cell. Here's the lipid membrane in, in light blue. Here's some of the polysaccharides that are decorating it in yellow. We're looking at from the outside of the cell at the surface of the cell. This is maybe like a cholesterol particle or something like that. And then there's these red small molecules floating around and this purple thing here maybe is a receptor on the surface of the cell that may or may not be sensitive to this red molecule that bumps into it. But what we're gonna focus on is the thing that decorates every cell in every mammal's body by the tens of thousands has these things. They're not receptors. They're called major histocompatibility complex, MHC, major histocompatibility complex. It's in blue here. And it is presenting, it is holding, the major histocompatibility complex is holding this small molecule in red, like a pair of hands holding the molecule. Uh, and it is, this is like the key slide of the whole talk. Okay. Every cell in your body and every mammal's body is, has thousands or tens of thousands of MHC transmembrane proteins poking out of its surface to the outside, holding little small protein fragments. It is holding protein fragments. They are holding protein fragments. Each holds one. Each holds a protein fragment of a protein that the cell is making. Every protein that every cell in your body is making is used for a purpose. Some of the cell, some of the proteins are chopped up into little fragments and the fragments are displayed on the outside surface of the cell. Every one of your cells is always displaying fragments of every protein that it's making. Fragments that are small, but not too small. Fragments that are long enough that they can, with pretty high accuracy, identify the protein that is being made. You think there's 20 amino acids, you'd only need to display like a dozen of them and you've probably got a unique hash for the protein. Okay. And by the way, they're displayed stretched out, unfolded, and unglycosylated. Very important for the immune system. Okay, here's the schematic of that. Here's the membrane for every cell. Here's the MHC is in red here, transmembrane protein, displaying this little orange S-shaped thing, which is some fragment of some protein that is being made inside the cell. Here is the MHC molecule. Here we're looking at it from the top. This is like the hand, the hands or the clamshell the two helices in orange. And then in, in color here in, in space filling sphere form is a given peptide that it's displaying from a fragment of one of the proteins that the cell is making. Here on the right, an MHC is displaying another peptide, another fragment of a different protein, or maybe another fragment of the same protein that the cell is making. Here's the side view with the MHC displaying the peptide in the transmembrane domain. Here's another picture there's two helices, which are kind of like the clamshell hands, which, are, which can hold all, anything, and they're displaying a peptide, nine amino acids here, P1 through P9. Notice that the yellow and blue coloration, it's not just the shape of the molecule that matters, it's the charge distribution on the molecule. So red is positive charge distribution and blue is negative charge distribution on this molecule. That's like a barcode that uniquely identify a 3D barcode of positive and negative charges arranged in an exact particular way. So reviewing what's happening, the RNA in your cell is directing the cell to make proteins. The proteins are made from the RNA by ribosomes, by assembling amino acids. Most of the proteins are put to work, 
but some amounts of the proteins get digested by this thing called the proteasome. So here is a protein shown as a bunch of peptide fragments linked together like different squares and triangles and stuff like that. These are like helices and, and, and different peptides of length 10 to 20 amino acids. The full folded proteins, some of them go into the proteasome. The proteasome digests them into fragments. This is always happening in every cell. Every cell is digesting stuff into fragments. The proteasome digests it into fragments. Oops. Then the fragments get loaded into these MHC molecules. So here we see like it's di damn it, I keep clicking my trackpad. Gets prote the protein gets digested into fragments, shown here with these little polygons. Uh, shapes, the shapes, individual shapes get loaded into the MHC. The MHC gets exported and presented on the surface of the cell. Every fragment of every protein that you're making is always being displayed on the surface of your cells. Every fragment that every cell of every protein that every cell is making, whether it's supposed to be making it or not. Okay, that's just another picture of the same thing. The MHC displaying the peptide fragments on the surface of your cells, every possible fragment of every possible protein. Now, what are viruses? Here's a false, you know, hand-colored electron microscope of SARS-CoV-2 infecting a monkey cell or attacking a monkey monkey cell. These viruses are far smaller than a wavelength of light. The monkey cell would be visible with a light microscope. The yellow viruses would not be. Viruses come in a great variety of shapes and sizes. They come in strandy forms. They come in polyhedral forms. Uh, here's a David Goodsell picture uh, of, um, I think this might be measles. But basically, you got some RNA or DNA instructions coiled up in green and yellow. You got some helper proteins in uh, blue and um, purple. You've got a, me a lipid membrane in purple, and then you've got spike proteins and other proteins that help the virus try and gain entry to the cell in blue. And you got all these helper proteins. That's basic architecture. Here's Ebola, same thing. Genetic material kind of packed in there with the instructions for how to build everything that the virus needs to build that the cell isn't already building for it. You got the helper proteins in purple. You got the spike proteins on Ebola in blue and the lipid membrane also here and maybe some helper proteins that help it gain entry in the cell in dark purple over here. Here is, here's SARS, a good cell picture, uh, SARS-CoV-2, here's COVID virus, good cell picture, genetic material, and what are called um, uh, nucleoproteins, which are uh, needs in, in blue, lipid membrane in gray, transmembrane helper proteins in pink, spike proteins in magenta. And here it is like in the, in the mix, getting attacked by antibodies and all this stuff. We'll talk about that later. Here's an electron micrograph, false colored of HIV virus. It, they're all HIV viruses, but they've been sliced. This is like a slice. So they're, they're sliced at different places. When you slice them right through the middle, you see this capsid and this membrane. So this is not a painting. This is just a real electron micrograph that's been covered. The HIV virus by good cell, also shows you, you got the nucleic acids and nucleoproteins in the HIV case, they're encapsulated in what's called a capsid. It's a very complicated virus. There's the membrane for HIV. There's the spike proteins that help it uh, fight it, get its way, uh, sneak its way into a healthy cell. And then there's these 20 or so proteins that it has, that it needs that the cell normally doesn't make. And it needs these proteins in order to self-assemble and to do its thing. So, you know, what AIDS viruses, like any other virus, it's, it's, it's spike proteins, if you will, somehow fool some cellular receptor into bonding to it. Then it, the receptor brings it close. Other proteins that it has on its surface somehow initiate um, merging with the cell membrane. These details are still being worked out for a lot of viruses. Once the virus is merged, it injects its genetic material into the cell, the gen and then the genetic material the cell starts processing that material like it does any other material. We don't need to go into reverse transcriptase and all that stuff because uh, COVID doesn't, doesn't do it that way. And then eventually the cell making viral proteins and viral RNA, whole viruses self-assemble and start budding out of the cell. Uh, yeah, again, a cartoon of, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, spike pro. Yeah, we won't go through this. Just to say this, a bunch of proteins. Here is a good cell picture of like what's going on with a similar type of virus like polio. Here it has merged with the cell membrane. The RNA from the polio virus is going into the cell. 
the ribosomes are starting to make viral proteins based on these RNA instructions, and the RNA is also getting polymerized to make duplicate RNA. DNA viruses inject themselves into the cell cycle kind of right here. Then they get transcribed to RNA, and the RNA gets transcribed to protein. RNA viruses like COVID bypass all that DNA mechanism and just directly start telling the cell to make proteins, and they have to carry with them the enzymes necessary to replicate RNA in the cytoplasm because normally RNA is not created inside the cytoplasm. Uh, remember, RNA gets read by ribosomes, which then make proteins based on the RNA code. And then when all, this is like a good cell picture of the whole process, like here's the viral RNA inside the cell in pink. It's directed the synthesis of more copies of itself and all these different viral proteins like F and C, etc. And then the whole thing self-assembles into these viral particles. You can see the capsid proteins coming together and then completed viral particles here that have their, their helper proteins and their RNA inside. And then eventually the completed viral particles will start budding out from the cell to go and infect other cells. But they'll also sometimes just grow like mad. Like here is a liver cell infected with hepatitis. And you can see there are so many viruses that the cell is like almost like it's, long, it's gone, like it's just gonna be viruses soon and eventually that's what happens. The cell can almost turn into a crystal made of viruses, even they've gotten into the nucleus here like that. So like, how can you possibly protect against this? So now we're gonna to get to the final lap here, how do mammalian cells collaborate when they're infected by viruses? Uh, to rid the body of viral infections. Well, we've all heard about antibodies, right? And now this talk is not about antibodies, but here's a, here's a virus, I guess, poliovirus and in orange and the blue are virus antibodies. So if you have the right antibodies that are sensitive to say the right proteins on the, on the surface of the virus, and these have to be proteins on the surface of the virus, then the antibodies can come stick to those proteins and signal the body's um, disposal systems to dispose of these antibody decorated objects. Uh, and that's sort of the, one of the main ways antibodies work. But I'd like to point out that there's no way an antibody is ever going to recognize something inside the virus because it can't get there. There's no way that an antibody is necessarily going to recognize anything that is evolving quickly because it's the surface proteins of the virus that evolve quickly because that's what allows it to evade the antibodies and that's what allows it to jump uh, species and all this kind of stuff. Antibodies also get confused by the sugars. Here is a um, spike protein for HIV, I think, in yellow, the, but the sugars that decorated are in orange. And so the, the antibodies, if they're going to get to this protein, either have to evade the sugars and sneak between them and recognize only the stuff that's not glycosylated, or they have to evolve, the antibodies have to be selected to actually bind to the sugars, which is a very highly variable situation. And uh, antibodies can be confused by sugars, and also they can become overactive if you tell them to bind to the wrong sugars. They can bind to your own cells, cause all kinds of problems. Uh, we'll skip this again, cartoon of of SARS-CoV-2. Oh, I want to say this cartoon doesn't show the helper proteins, but now the helper proteins for COVID-19 have all been mapped. The genomes, of course, have been completely mapped. There's about 20 different proteins that the virus carries along inside of itself, as well as carrying along instructions inside of itself for how to make these proteins, because these are not proteins that any normal cell would ever make. So remember, these are proteins that your cells would never make under normal circumstances, but the virus needs your cells to make these proteins in order to propagate the virus itself. So it carries instructions in its genome. These NSPs are called non-structural proteins, and then there's RNA polymerase proteins and the famous spike proteins and um, envelope proteins and all this stuff. Non-self, these proteins are non-self from your perspective. They are the virus's proteins, not yours, and the virus is gonna try and get your cells to make them. But what's gonna happen once your cells start making these viral proteins? Well, just like you know, the RNA, the viral RNA is in fact inside your cell. Your cell is busy following the instructions blindly to make proteins, in this case, viral proteins. The viral proteins are going to self-assemble into viruses, but some amount of the viral proteins will be broken up into peptide fragments that are still small enough to pretty much uniquely identify them. And the peptide fragments will, as we said, from the viral proteins, as well as your own proteins, get loaded into the MHC molecules, and the MHC molecules get sent to the surface of your cell and display the peptides, fragments. And in this case, this triangle peptide fragment might be a fragment of a viral protein, a non-self protein. Remember, MHC displays the peptide fragments of every protein your body is making. So it's kind of like 
imagine the, a sort of weird situation. The cell is like a city full of factories. Okay, the, the cell has all these different fact. Uh, no, excuse me. The cell, the body is like a city full of factories. And the, every one of your cells is like a particular factory, let's say. And every, let's imagine that every factory in the city is, has, a jan, has janitors going around the factory collecting pieces of everything that the factory is making, kind of pilfering the pieces and putting them in bins outside the factory for display so that the roving police inspectors can always be looking at the pieces of everything the factories are making. Every factory in the city is making different things and the police are always looking around, peeking into the bins outside the factory, seeing the fragments of what it's making. And they're like, this is cool. And this, this, this thing, this factory's making whiskey and this factory's making coffee. And we can tell because it's a handle of a coffee cup and this factory's making, you know, electronics, that's cool. And then it's like, all of a sudden, uh, they come along and they're like, uh-oh, what's this? This is a bomb. This is a piece of a bomb. No factories are supposed to be making bombs. And then they sound the alarm and they radio into headquarters and they uh, do all kinds of things that we'll get into. But you have to imagine every factory is displaying every piece of everything it's making and your body knows what it's supposed to be making and what it's not supposed to be making. How does it know this? Because you have a library of millions of kinds of T cells in your body that are all different and Every T cell carries this blue protein called the T cell receptor, and they're highly variable. These little loopy ends right here can recognize different peptides that are presented by the MHC molecules. And MHC is presenting every fragment of every protein that every cell is making on the outside of the cell, including if the cell is presenting, if the cell is making viral proteins, it's presenting viral protein fragments. So here is MHC at the bottom, peptide fragment in the cleft, T cell receptor, in this case, bonded to the peptide fragment that's displayed. When I say bonded, what do I mean? What I mean, it's not just the sort of lock and key metaphor that the, that the complementary shapes of the T cell receptor and the peptide it's sensitive to are, are complementary, but even the positive and negative charges shown here in red and blue have to line up. It's not just shape, it's also electronic structure. They have to line up, and if they line up, it's a match, and if it's a match, things happen. Here again, MHC molecule at the bottom, transmembrane protein being displaying on the surface peptide fragments of every protein that every cell in your body is making. T cell receptor with these highly variable loop regions. Millions of these loop regions are like 20 amino acids long, so there can be millions of combinations of these loop regions, each one specialized for recognize a particular molecule. Now, when you're in a fetus, you're, any T cell that you have that recognizes your own proteins gets deleted. And your library of T cells gets pared down somewhat to only contain T cells that, rep, that recognize non-self or foreign proteins. So now you, throughout life, until you get old, you have all these T cells circulating in your body and every one of them is tuned to recognize a different non-self protein. And obviously there can be a vast number of possible non-self proteins, most of which you've never seen. And then as you get older and get exposed and get infected, things happen. So here's a close-up. Here's the MHC. Here's a particular fragment of a particular protein, presumably a non-self protein in this case, because we have a T cell receptor whose variable regions shown in, in red and actually also green and purple, um, the variable regions are recognizing this non-self peptide. Now this T cell receptor is, um, of course, oh, here's some more details. People are working at all these, I don't have time for this. And I don't have time for this either, but this is kind of appearing into the electronic structure and what's really going on to show that it's, it's quantum mechanics. It's far beyond mechanics. It's like these are charge distributions and they're in motion when all this stuff happens, but we can use the mechanical analogy. So here it is. Here's the MHC protein. Here's the antigen presenting cell on the bottom, your normal cell. It's presenting a little fragment here of some protein that it's making. This is happening, you know, millions of thousands of times on every cell surface with every fragment of every protein that every cell is making. Here's a T cell receptor that has matched this particular peptide fragment in green. Here's the T cell membrane on top and the T cell is above. And the basic thing that happens is if the cells are just, if the T cell sees that the, your cell is displaying a self protein, it says no problem. If it sees that your cell is displaying a non-self protein, it gets activated, okay? Now, so here we see the whole process. Like proteins are made, 
They're digested, they're loaded into MHC. MHC is presented at the surface of the cell and T cell receptors go around checking these little green peptide fragments and saying, do I recognize this? I've been tuned to recognize a particular non-self protein. If I recognize this, sound the alarm. What kind of alarm can it sound? Well, a, TD, a CD8 T cell can sound the alarm to trigger the cell to kill itself. It could say, You've been, I recognize you're, infect, you're displaying a non-self peptide. You should um, commit suicide in an orderly way, shut yourself down, break down all your components and make them available as nutrients for neighboring cells. That's called apoptosis. And a, a cell that even if it's infected by a virus, most cells can still do this when they're given the signal. Um, so here they is again, CD8 T cells. Here's a, here's a virally infected cell. Here's the little viruses. Here's the little viral proteins being displayed on the MHC. Here's a, side, here's a CD8 T cell that recognizes the viral protein and it sends a signal to this infected cell to do an orderly shutdown. Stop building proteins, stop building viruses, stop replicating, dissolve. Now you don't want this to go out of hand. You don't want this process to, to get out of control. You really want it highly regulated. So even though we talk about the MHC molecule here shown on at the top cell, is, the above cell is presenting antigen, the T cell is on the bottom. There's all these other all these other receptors which have to be triggered to really make this cell self-destruct signal uh, be believed by the target cell. So in order to kill the cell, a number of things have to line up. This whole thing is getting more and more mapped out. It's called the immunological synapse. I'm not going to go through all this, obviously, but obviously I mean, you can imagine how many careers go into mapping out the dynamics of all these molecular interactions that make sure that it's time to turn on the signal and make sure that it's time to turn it off. The main last type of T cell I want to talk about is CD4 T cells, and they really run the show. Um, they're the ones that trigger everything, and they're the ones where we, when we talk about having immunity, we mean what's mediated by CD4 T cells. When the CD4 T cell does this thing, here's, here's MHC. The antigen-presenting cell is at the top. The MHC is the green guy. It's presenting the viral peptide in brown. The T cell recognizes that particular T cell recognizes that particular peptide using its T cell receptor, specially coded from the library of millions in red. And that initiates this whole signaling cascade inside the T cell. The signaling cascade is complicated, more and more stuff. It involves signals going into the nucleus here at the bottom, turning on new genes. And what happens when a T cell sees a non-self protein presented by one of your other cells, the T cell, CD4 T cell recognizes a non-self protein that causes it to go to start releasing special chemicals called cytokines. Not all cytokines are bad. These cytokines cause the T cell to massively replicate. So it's as if like the police inspector found the bomb parts in the bin outside the factory and then says like, it's like the matrix. It's like it clones itself into a thousand or a million copies of itself because it's like, bomb parts. I know what to do. It makes a million copies of itself. Some, and then those copies start to differentiate. Some of those copies become, become macrophages that can engulf infected cells, again, by recognizing the ones that are displaying non-self proteins. Some become B cells. Well, some cause B cells to be replicated that produce antibodies against those particular proteins that are the non-self proteins that are displayed by the MHC on the infected cells. Uh, some produce more cytokines and tell cells to stop replicating. Some go become memory T cells. And this we know has something to do with how you maintain your immunity for things that you were exposed to once, at least for a time. But the whole way that memory T cells work is controversial and not fully worked out yet, even, even as of April, 2020. I tried to do some research on it and there's a lot of argument about how memory T cells work, but we know they, they, they exist and, and they're somehow involved in in maintaining, uh, in, in, they're somehow involved in short circuiting this whole procedure, which takes many days, if you ever get exposed a second time to a new virus. Okay, so when people say, you know, does, do people get immunity to SARS CoV 2? What they mean is, uh, do the memory T cells work and how effectively? But the, the press makes this stuff so much more stupider and so much more fearful than it, than it really should be. I'm just trying to tell you, so this is a miracle going on. You are infected by a thousand viruses all the time and this is always going on okay you're every one of the bacteria you have thousands of species of bacteria in your gut or hundreds of species at least every one of those bacterial species has hundreds of viruses that infect it the virome is the most diverse 
uh, collection of life, if you want to call it life, on the planet. Every species of organism, plant, animal, fungi, and bacteria has a hundred different viruses that are specialized just to infect that one species. So the, we're not getting rid of the virome. It kind of, in some sense, ruins the show. Uh, and anyway, and then some of these uh, activated CD4 T cells expand and differentiate and produce cytotoxic T lymphocytes. They're the last thing we're going to talk about because I'm five minutes over time. And uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes really do a lot of the heavy lifting for destroying virally infected cells. And, and we talked about these already. The cytotoxic T lymphocytes, the CD8 cells, are the ones that when they recognize a cell displaying a foreign non-self peptide, they tell the cell to commit suicide. So all these different types of cells differentiate from the first T cells, which recognize the non-self peptides. And that process takes a few days. And, you know, that's, that's where the race is, right? If you can do this quickly enough, then you uh, will clear your body of infected cells. And if you can't, then you may lose the race. Now, there are other factors involved here. This is all the acquired immune system. There's the innate immune, oh, B cell receptor signaling. We're not even going to talk about that. But, I mean, you can imagine how many careers go into working this shit out. It's just astonishing. And it's just the greatest miracle you could ever imagine if you can think of like how a lifeless universe came up with this stuff and it's going on everywhere all the time on earth. Okay. Uh, we're going to skip this. So we'll talk, this is like second to last slide. We will talk about the innate immune system, which we haven't really talked about yet, which is kind of what gets into action first. And it's not specialized against the cells that have been infected with a particular virus. The innate immune system has a number of tricks to kind of at least keep the virus at bay while the adaptive immune system gears up for the like special forces response against the infected cells. The innate immune system uh, does a few different things. Let's just say one thing. Normal healthy cells are always supposed to have MHC on their surface displaying pet fragments of every protein that every cell is making so that if it's making a virus, the immune system will be informed of this. But you would imagine a clever virus might say, I know what to do. I'm going to infect the cell and stop it from displaying MHC, stop it from making MHC and stop it from displaying anything on its surface. And that way I can stay in stealth mode and replicate and the immune system will not kill me. Well, the immune system is always looking to make sure that your cells are, that have MHC on the surface. And that's one of the innate immune system's job. It doesn't care what the MHC is displaying. It's just looking to make sure it's there. And if it finds a cell like these cells where there's no MHC on the surface and there's no presentation of the peptides that the cell is making, it triggers the cell to die. Natural killer cell comes along and says, you're not displaying MHC. You're trying to sneak around the defense. You're like disobeying the transparency rules, time to commit suicide. So the cell commits suicide. Meanwhile, if the cell doesn't want to commit suicide, the innate immune system will also emit cytokines that put neighboring cells into what's called an antiviral state. And that's where they reduce their uh, synthesis of new proteins and they have other pr procedures internally that are just being worked out. And they may be acting then a little, a little less efficiently, but they're sure going to stop making as many viruses. This is what happens if they don't display the MHC or even if they have other aberrant behaviors. The innate immune system puts them in an antiviral state, which they can't be in forever or the organism's going to get sick. And by the way, if you have cytokines all the time in your diet because you're eating sugar and you're eating seed oils and you have pollution and all this kind of stuff, then the cytokines are going to always be putting your cells in an, in an antiviral state, which paradoxically is going to weaken them against viruses, as you might imagine, if you chronically excite a system that's only supposed to be excited once in a while when you're acutely infected, you end up kind of burning it out and just, and just screwing everything up by having your cells in an inefficient state all the time instead of specially turned on to a special state only when they're infected by viruses. So this is part of not the cytokine storm, but the degradation of the general met metabolic system that comes about from chronic cytokine release. So yeah, and another, and of course, the, the um, innate immune system also produces antibodies that kind of recognize generic viral proteins and gathers them up, like we saw that polio virus decorated with antibodies. It gathers them up and it, it uh, eats them. 
And so, or it kills them. Here's an example of some antibodies binding to some viral, uh, some bacterial glycoproteins, and eventually the antibodies cause the uh, complex to engage in the bacterial membrane that ruptures the bacterial membrane and kills the bacteria. So that's enough on the innate immune system. And then last, second to last slide, just reviewing the acquired immune system, which was what this um, talk is mostly about. Um, you have specialized uh, cells, which actually, um, there's a number of different things that the acquired immune system can do. It can make custom antibodies to, cu to, kill the, to disable the viruses. It can stick, get the viruses all stuck into the mucus. It can, it can kill the cells through lysis uh, that are infected and aren't responding. You don't really want to lyse the cells that are infected with viruses because that releases virus particles. So the preferred thing is, again, as we talked about, the, the real special forces and the ones who do the heavy lifting, the cytotoxic T lymphocytes, they're the ones that get turned on that recognize cells that are infected with viruses because those cells are displaying viral proteins, viral protein fragments on the surface, and they initiate the apoptosis, the orderly shutdown of those cells so that they can be recycled. And all the viruses and everything just get broken down into their component parts. Last two slides. I'm gonna show you now something that puts all this together with COVID and immunity and positivity and, um, and a lot of the controversies involving the seriousness of COVID and the importance of lockdowns and all of these controversial topics that everyone is so hot and bothered about. Here is the rarest of all things in this day and age. Here is a peer reviewed paper from a couple of weeks ago on COVID. It's not a preprint. It's not a fucking blog post. It's not some Facebook thing by some amateur like me. It is a peer reviewed paper by people from top labs talking about the T-cell response to COVID-19. Okay, and it's in the journal Cell, which is, along with Nature and Science, is the top reviewed journal for molecular biology. In fact, it's only molecular biology, unlike Nature and Science, which, is, which are both general science magazines um, or journals. Okay, so the point is, this is the main graphic from, the, from this peer-reviewed pa recent paper on COVID-19, and what it shows, Okay, here's the SARS-CoV-19 here's the COVID-19 virus SARS-CoV-2. It infects. And when you check infected people, you look at their T cells, 100% of the infected people have have CD4 T cells that are sensitive to the spike protein, the membrane protein, the nuclear proteins and the non-structural proteins. Remember we showed all these different proteins that that the COVID virus needs to make to assemble itself, non-self proteins and you have T cells like the matching all these different fragments. That's what these little bars are here, in all these different viral proteins that are displayed on the surface of infected cells. And then you have CD8 cells, which are these cytotoxic killer cells. And 70% of the people who get infected with COVID, who they tested, had cytotoxic killer T cells that are sensitive to these various proteins. And I would like to point out that most of these proteins, except for the spike proteins, are internal to the virus. Antibodies will pretty much never see these things. Only T cells will see them because they're displayed by these MHC molecules. Every single component, whether it's inside the virus or outside the virus, virus, if it's being made by the cell, it's displayed and the cytotoxic T cells and the CD4 T cells, helper cells will see it. Okay. Now, as you may know and may have heard, there are other coronaviruses that infect humans. Many, you've been infected by many coronaviruses. Some good fraction of the colds you've had in your life are coronaviruses. And they have structural homology in their proteins to... SARS-CoV-2. It tends to not be the spike protein or anything on the surface because that's the rapidly evolving part. But there is homology between common cold and SARS-CoV-2. And when these same groups looked at the T cells of people who had not been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, what they found was that 50% of them had CD4 T cells that were tuned to peptide fragments for SARS-CoV-2, even though they'd never been exposed to SARS-CoV-2, peptide fragments from the spike, the non-structural proteins and the mem membrane proteins. They'd just been infected with common colds in the past. And the same with their CD8 uh, cells, 20%, only 20% of them, but nevertheless had cytotoxic T lymphocytes that are specially programmed to recognize peptide fragments from COVID. Why? Because COVID has similar peptides 
and proteins in it to SARS-CoV-2, especially on the inside where the evolutionary pressure isn't so high. So I think this is very interesting. Unexposed individuals have T cells, some, some unexposed individuals, some significant fraction have T cells that are specifically targeted or can be specifically targeted to attack uh, SARS-2 infection. And so isn't that interesting? And when you talk about infection rate and asymptomatic rate and antibody testing, this is beyond all of that. You may not have any antibodies at all for SARS-CoV-2. You may not ever, ever have been exposed to SARS-CoV-2 and you may have T cells that are maybe effective against it. You know, this is what they say, like immunity to related viruses and stuff like that. Anyway, this is sort of the anti-fear porn portion of the SARS debate. Um, so summarizing, we've talked about my sources of information. We've talked about what cells do. We've talked a little about what are viruses. And we've talked about the adaptive immune response that is a mammal's only thing pretty much to viruses and how it works. So I have a couple of YouTube videos I could show if people are interested that are a few minutes long each that kind of show animations of what I just talked about. But now I'm done and uh, thank you very much. I'm gonna end the screen share as soon as I can figure out how to do it. I just ended your screen share. <laughs> thank, 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 thank you. you. <laughs> thank you so, so much. That was insane. Um, very like, just like, yeah, it was a true like little exhale moment. Very uh, aesthetically pleasing. I think a bunch of us ordered the books uh, that, that you're referencing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, no, it was like really like an aesthetically pleasing talk, which I think you can't often say about, you know, um, topics. Like, I mean, usually when we have technical competitions, the slides are all over the place. Uh, and this was just a really in like really easy to grasp. Uh, meanwhile, still like super out there uh, out the discussion. Thank you so so much. I know that you put a ton of work into this, and I'm really 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 grateful that uh, you got to share it with us. It it really showed. It was a pretty outstanding presentation. Thank you. <laughs> um, I appreciate it. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> okay, well we have a, a few questions here. I, I mean we're all over time, and if you if you have to hop off, that's fair enough. Um, um, uh, otherwise, I would go with David Grossoff who had a question, uh, and I think David is already unmuted. So yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't been looking at the chat at all. Obviously, I was just trying to not lose my place. Well, so. actually, Melanie, Melanie, who's uh, who also gave a, a faucet salon on uh, immunology, she uh, is here in the chat and was asking a few, uh, answering a few questions from participants. So oh, thanks no, for I that, Melanie. Melanie, I apologize. I'm just an amateur. So excuse my. Please tell me what I need to fix. Okay, David, do you want to so, go with the question? So here's my question. Um, some cells can't be killed uh, because they're very expensive to replace, like neurons. And there's this notion of immunologic privilege. I understand it only at the crudest level. What, what do you think we should know about that and how it relates to the, to the battle against viruses like COVID? Oh, that's a really good point. Yeah, like I know, like that's how uh, herpes simplex virus survives in humans, right? It goes into the basal ganglia, which are privileged since they can't be killed without paralyzing you. And um, yeah, you know something, I uh, I should have, I should know something about that, but um, I don't. And the same is true of HIV, right? It goes inside of the T cells themselves, which are privileged and which also are essential to fighting off other viruses. So. Uh, one thing I will say about this is that I think some of these viruses that you're talking about may be slow. Like they have to, like there's a compromise I guess they make. Now, I guess uh, meningitis isn't necessarily slow. Is that even a virus? But whatever. I don't know. That's a great question. Okay. Okay. Um, I made Melanie Coase in case. Oh, wait. I, I have a speculation. I have a speculation, David, which is that I speculate that those kinds of cells which are privileged and are like irreplaceable, if you will, if indeed they are irreplaceable, um, they make sacrifices. Like they probably sacrifice certain amounts of efficiency and they, like, they don't replicate so much and they maybe don't do, uh, maybe they're more specialized and less energy efficient in exchange for having other defense and depth that normal cells don't need because they can rely on being killed by T cells. Melanie, if you want to chime in and uh, correct Creon on anything or expand on anything that uh, he said, please. Oh, it was it so. was such a great talk, and there's never been a better time to be an immunologist in life. Really, We're, we got more popular than I ever expected. Um, 
<laughs> so no, I think I think that was that was a fine answer. Um, you do have death of neurons, but um, there are there are many more kind of checkpoints in place to try to try to prevent that. Um, so, so there are diseases and viral infections that will cause the death of neurons. Viruses are very good at going dormant in neurons. And so they don't express that MHC1 on the surface that alerts the immune system that something's wrong. So that's why they kind of have that long lived protection in neurons. Oh yeah. That makes sense that neurons would not even display as much MHC because they don't want to get targeted, especially inadvertently. And also, um, I would imagine the other thing you said is very important. It's not just that the cells make certain trade-offs in exchange for privilege status, they have maybe less efficiency or less replication, but the viruses make trade-offs. In exchange for living in these cells, they have to obey certain rules <laughs> most of the time. Exactly, exactly. Immune system evasion. It's just an amazing arms race. I mean, I didn't talk much about it, but the one example I showed was like, it's certain viruses will try and turn off MHC presentation and then the immune system won't allow that. If it sees a cell has turned off MHC presentation, it will kill the cell, you know, simplistically speaking. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I thought that on a metaphorical level, and I think Jeremy Helm made a similar comment just now in the chat, uh, the, the little police meta metaphor, like, <laughs> that was nuts, you know. Uh, also, I think, you know, thinking back on, you know, many of the kind of contact tracing salons that we've done. And if you, I mean, I, I just got reminded of like Marvin Minsky's Society of Mind and how he kind of like basically makes all of those analogies between, you know, how our mind works, between how, so, how we work in society. And you made kind of like a similar thing uh, with this kind of like insane um, kind of police surveillance state that comes and then like suddenly all of the police officers are multiplying themselves and like, you know, like are in, 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 in uh, an eternal surveillance of the factories via the janitors. And like, it was, it was quite yeah, That was my own, that's my own analogy that I just came up with while I was preparing the talk, by the way. And also I wanted to say something else, which was in my notes, but I forgot to read it. And maybe Melanie could uh, tell me her opinion on this. In my opinion, based on, you know, my, my sort of layperson's interest in, in molecular biology, the immune system is the most complicated molecular biology thing there is, except for maybe the brain and certainly except for development of the organism like the fetus and you know the embryo and that kind of like autopoiesis of the whole organism like that includes the generation of the immune system and the neuro neural system so it's more complicated but the immune system the mammalian immune system is like it's a computer scientist's dream i mean it's all about information processing and machinery and code and evasion and patching it's really beautifully complex I would absolutely agree with that. It's probably one of the most complex biological systems um, that we have a sense of understanding. I mean, humans alone have a couple hundred subtypes of different immune cells. So when you say a T cell, you're really talking about 20 to 30 different subsections of cell types. And then all the cells that support the immune system response. It, it's, it's one of the most complex systems in the world um, in human biology period. And then there's crosstalk with the nervous system as well. And so, so the levels of complexity are, are significant there. Yeah. It's, um, and I, Melanie, here's another thing I'd like to ask you, if you don't mind. Um, so I was learning all this stuff you know, years ago, and I just brushed up on some new things like the immunological synapse and some of these signal cascades that weren't known at all when I first looked into it, you know, in the late, late 90s. But, um, but uh, what I realized was that when AIDS came along, it made this huge renaissance in understanding of virology and immunology because everybody was pivoting to work on this disease, which was mm -hmm. believed rightly to be an existential threat to the human race because it had a 100% fatality rate and it could be transmitted with like one sexual encounter or from a mother to a through childbirth. And, mm -hmm. and, and so everybody like pivoted and started working on AIDS and we never got an AIDS vaccine, but we got a massive understanding of like all these T cell receptors and differentiation and all this stuff that I've gone reviewed here and you know, lots more. Do you think or hope as I do that with the worldwide, uh, uh, I don't know if we'd call it panic, but emphasis on, on COVID-19 that we will have now a similar renaissance enabled by all the new tools we have, you know, CRISPR and PCR and deep sequencing and bioinformatics. Like, will we get the next level of understanding of the immune system and virology, even if we don't get a COVID vaccine? Because of yeah, I really, I really hope so. You know, the world is suddenly focused on the and and realizes how significant a pandemic disease can be. And you're absolutely right. There really was a renaissance in our.
the attacks. I mean, there was so much focus um, and so many careers were made, as you stated, on, on developing an understanding of these pathways, if there's any way we could circumvent HIV infection or suppress it within T cells. Um, yeah, and I, I can, you know, one can only hope that this is the beginning of another renaissance in how we do everything from drug development and clinical trials. Um, you know, we can look at ways that safety is controlled better now that we have a, more of an understanding of the biology behind it to how we control pandemic disease and how we approach that. So yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really optimistic that this is the start of something better for human health and medicine. Oh, wow. That's a, a, a really nice, I think, uh, excellent note to, uh, to almost end it on. I do want to give Mike uh, also the, uh, the chance to ask another question. If I find you to meet you. Uh, okay, great, Mike. Thanks. Yeah, I was um, um, heard the comment about there being like a virome as well as you know, a biome. Yeah, I was wondering if there's any known examples of there being symbiotic viruses, like there are symbiotic bacteria. Okay, well, let me say this about that. The answer is, I would say, and Melanie or anyone else can correct me who knows more, Almost certainly, yes. Like, none of this stuff is an accident. Nothing in nature exists outside of natural selection having taken advantage of it. Arguably, most, arguably, a great deal of the evolution that has happened in life has been driven by viruses, which we didn't talk about this. They can sometimes transfer genes between even whole, wholly separate species um, because sometimes the viral genome will get incorporated into the host genome. And so, it turns out that it may be that as much or more of evolution has been driven by, uh, what do they call it, horizontal gene transfer medi mediated by viruses than has been uh, driven by classic mutations or even sexual selection. So in a sense, the viruses may be responsible for a great deal of what we call evolution. And also, uh, we would it's, I think it's become known now, Melanie can correct me if I'm wrong, that a lot that some are, large fraction of the genomes of most species apparently got there by viruses inserting these genes. Now, whether these are, are important beneficial genes or neutral or detrimental or what, you know, that's a details, but, it's in, but something's going on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm going to drop a, a link to a book called Darwin's Blind Spot in the comments. Um, and so this, this book talks a lot about symbiotic relationships between, I think, viruses, um, plants, animals, fungi, um, and how, um, and there's also um, a little bit of study about how we have a lot of virus DNA in our genome. And the idea that we could have um, co-evolved a lot of the functions that we see in mammalian cells because of the virus or or evolution was stimulated by the virus is is pretty well accepted and so there's there's some interesting research out there for sure but that's a great book to start with thanks a lot i love it oh, awesome okay well thank you so so much thank you so much melanie for jumping in <laughs> thanks I, I didn't want to put you on the spot but i thought it was uh, super useful oh no it's super fun immunology is my my bread and butter i live in it so so happy to be here and so happy to see everyone so interested thank you creon awesome talk Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate any uh, pointing out any errors in private, of course. Um, <laughs> of course. <laughs> of course. I can still t tinker around with the video to make any corrections. Uh, no, but okay. really, like, I think, you know, like, especially when you pointed to, well, you know, are we going to now have like a renaissance in like in, in tools and in the way that we can do science and, and all the things that we may be finding out, even if we don't get a vaccine or something. And it's really interesting because, you know, we, we talked about that in, in a more social context before, right? Like, uh, renaissance from the plague, you know, kind of like roaring 20s from the Spanish flu. Could we do something similar in, on a cultural level from COVID? But like, if this is happening science driven, you know, right now as we speak, then I think this is something that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that I've not talked about at all in the salon and provides me a ton of hope because I think especially like, uh, you know, may, maybe some of the collateral benefits that we may not even know uh, are some things that, uh, that, uh, that, that I get to come. So thank you so much. I want to leave it on that positive note. <laughs>